We're now going to go into our first actual module, which is module one, which contains three subsections or three topics. The first one I'm going to go over, as the slide indicates here, is computer system components. Now, this is an introduction, or as some books like to say, a 50,000 foot view. We're going to get more focused and get a lot closer when we get into module five. So here, I just wanna make sure that we all understand what we're talking about, our frame of reference, and some terminology and some initial concepts for the certification that will be helpful for you. So, let's get into it. First thing is just a computer system, or a typical computer system. Here you see an external device, a printer. We have, of course, our system unit, our PC. We'll talk primarily, well, everything that we're going to talk about here is with the PC. We will get into laptops later on. Of course, a monitor or display de device, keyboard, mouse, and even some speakers. So we'll cover other things that we can plug into this machine as well. It's just, again, this is our introduction. The motherboard or system board is one of the main components and contains several subcomponents that we're going to break down here for you in this introduction. For right now, I don't have to worry about a lot of the details because again, like I mentioned before, we're gonna see these in module five. But suffice it to say that the terminology that we need here is either motherboard or system board. And this will contain several things that we will then zero in on and focus on as we continue through not only this section, but other modules as well. Okay, the CPU. Please understand that CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. Here on this slide, we're just giving you some samples of sockets and or CPUs that we can place onto the mother or system board. So this is where the main processing is done. This is where you can spend quite a bit of money depending on the type of support that you need. What we're gonna learn later is the idea of, okay, I've got this type of computer that's audio visual editing machine. What type of CPU is gonna match that? Or I'm just using word processing. What's a good processor for that? Or, or how far do we need to go? What capabilities? So we're gonna introduce concepts like cache, all types of different speeds that we have to talk about, processing, memory functions. So stay tuned, we'll get a lot more in detail, but for right now, just understand that the main processor is referred to as the CPU. On our next slide, you'll see an example of a memory bank. The main thing to remember about memory, at least right now, is the two types of memory that will be certainly testable on the exam is the idea of random access memory, or RAM, and read-only memory, which is ROM. The easiest way to think about this, and here's two other terms that you'll need to be responsible for, is the concept of non-volatile memory and volatile memory. Basically, RAM is volatile, read-only memory is non-volatile. The difference between that is, if I lose power to my device, what happens to the information in memory? Well, in RAM, if I lose power, whether I do it willingly or not, that information goes away. So that's why it's always good to save your work uh, at appropriate times. So this way, if something does go wrong, you'll have the information saved on your storage or on your hard drive or wherever. The idea of non-volatile or read-only memory, and we're going to see the slide in just a few minutes, is the idea of firmware. This is software or code that the manufacturer has put in that allows for the computer to boot up before we load in our operating system. Obviously, if that information went away, like volatile memory would in RAM, we wouldn't have the information to even have, allow for the code for the computer to come up. So that's the main classifications or distinctions that you need to make now, is RAM versus ROM and volatile versus non-volatile. We'll get into all the flavors and all that later on. A next slide, or the next concept, and this one's pretty easy. 
the system bus. If you look at the picture, you get an idea of really the system bus being that common plane or that connecting point between, here they show you the CPU, the hard drive controller, other components on the system board. The system bus is quite simply the series of wires or paths. I mean, if you think about your highway system or your road system, that could be considered to be the system bus or the infrastructure that we use to get from point A to point B. So there are many different types of system buses. The reason why we have to be aware of the system bus because that will describe the type of slots that we have available to put expansion or adapter cards in. So again, we'll cover the different types of buses as we move on. But for right now, I want to make sure that you understand what a system bus is. The different designs also indicate the type of speeds and how quickly we move information between our components. But as long as you have the idea of a system bus being the interconnection of all your components via the printed circuit board connections or even wires, if that helps you out better, that's fine. As long as you understand that purpose, we're good. Storage devices, probably one of the easier things for new people to understand is exactly that. Where do we store our information? We just learned that in RAM, the information goes away if we lose power to that device. So we need some sort of permanent storage. So we, ha we have an example of an external hard disk, an internal hard disk, we have probably what's very recognizable and what a lot more people have is, is what I call the little thumb drive. So we need to store our information somewhere. So we will cover many different examples of storage devices, how we connect those storage devices, how we get power to those storage devices, and obviously the different flavors and types of storage devices that are available and what is going to be most appropriate for us to use. That's one of the key things that you also want to bear in mind while you're preparing for your exam, is to not only be able to understand what you have available, but what you are going to use it for. And I will try to give as many examples as I can to relate all of this to real world situations that will also help you better prepare for your exam. Power supplies, the only abbreviation you really have to worry about here is PSU, Power Supply Unit. The components are fairly straightforward on a power supply. We need something for cooling, we have a switch, we have of course a connector for our power cord, and we also have a voltage switch. I'm not sure how often you may get this uh, concept tested, but used to be in the old days they would want to make sure that you understood the impact of how that voltage switch could mess you up. The idea of, okay, you turn on your computer and nothing happens. It's completely dead. You have verified that the power is present or that you see a cord going from your device into the wall and you verify that power does exist but nothing happens. This is a classic example of checking that voltage switch. The whole idea is, is that, of course, in the United States, we have 120 power. Well, in many other countries, it's 220. So if we have the switch at 220 and our power, of course, is 120, chances are the power device won't work. Now, a lot of power devices now are automatic in this way, that, or, or at least will accept the 220 on down. So we really don't care. At least this is very true with laptop devices and the power that we have here. But it's kind of an old question, or it can be, but do be aware of it. Cooling systems, we'll talk about where are, or where is it appropriate to have cooling systems. Of course, fans on top of processors, those get very warm. We just saw the fans in the power supply. We'll see fans on video cards. So the thing that you need to be aware of is where is it appropriate, or is it best to have cooling? So right now we see an example of a fan on top of a CPU. So we don't have to worry a lot about the fans, perhaps rotations per minute or some basic things about what type of cooling and what type of flow we're going to get with that. But again, we'll get in detail as we move on. But the idea of having cooling systems is certainly necessary 
for our PC units, whether they're a PC unit or a laptop. Expansion cards, here I'm able to kill two birds with one stone. Here we have an example of more than likely a video card. Uh, I can tell because it, if you look at the far left hand side, I do see the classic 15 pin VGA connector. And there you even see a cooling fan. So a lot of cards are as possible because of now the demands of video and with gaming systems and video editing stations wanting to have very high end, crisp, digital images. It's a lot of processing that we've taken away from the central processor and now we've moved to our VGA or, or our video card. I was going to say VGA card. There you can see my age on that one. But so now we have chips just designed for processing video and they get hot too. So there you can see a cooling fan that's residing right on top of the processor for the video. I'll even show you later on a video card that makes this thing look like nothing. So again, the idea of expansion cards is also something we'll go into as we move on. Riser cards, from a PC standpoint, probably not many of you will be exposed to this. But what a riser card does, as you can see, is allows us to really add more slots. So this is true in rack-mounted system, especially with servers. If we've got a server that has a lot of capability or flexibility in it that may have quite a few cards in it, we may have to increase our capability to add even more cards into it. So the idea of a riser card is really allowing you to increase the amount of slots that you have. Typically this is more true for servers, but if you've got a really pumped up desktop PC and you've got lots of capability for multimedia and whatever else you may have for it, you may expand the capability by installing a riser card. That is indeed if it fits the right bus and you've got enough, literally enough room in your box. Firmware. I just used the analogy of firmware being a type of ROM. As you can see on my slide, at the very bottom, they call it a programmable read-only memory chip. Another term that you'll be familiar with, and you'll see it now and we'll see it later, is the idea of flashing your memory or flashing the firmware. Many times manufacturers will have updates to their firmware. So you would then download those updates and do a flash, or you would flash your ROM to update the code that the manufacturer says, hey, we've now brought this up to, I don't know, version 3. It'd be advisable that you update your machines to this for various benefits, or maybe just to keep your machine up to date. So firmware is, again, this code that's in read-only memory that controls the basic operations of our computer. And speaking of basic operations, We've got a thing called BIOS. BIOS stands for Basic Input Output System. A lot of times, I kind of think BIOS in conjunction with firmware. However, BIOS we deal a lot more with uh, on a tech basis. Several times, if although the computers move pretty fast these days, but in the old days, when you would turn on your computer, you would see while your computer is booting and doing the power on self-test, that you could press a button to get into the BIOS for setup. Setting up time, boot order, whether I want it to boot off my CD-ROM first and then my hard drive second, uh, setting up passwords. There are many options inside the basic input-output system that will allow us to control the nature of our machine. And like I mentioned before, boot order, and there's many other things that we can see as well. So, Again, just want to make sure that you understand that BIOS can exist on its own separate chip. Again, this is a manufacturer thing. And we'll get into details as we move on. But understand what basic input-output system is, and bear with us and you'll see a lot more as we go. Post, the power on self-test, I've already been hinting to this, is the routine that happens, if you will, when you turn on your computer. And basically it checks to make sure that everything is good. 
similar to when you start up your car and you see lots of LEDs and status lights come on and then hopefully they all clear away. Well, it's the same type of deal here with the power on self-test. Your computer is doing a check making sure memory's good, your hard drives are there, if you have floppy drives, uh, that your, your bus is good, as you see there, I.O. bus or the controller. So it's quite simply an onboard diagnostic, if you will, to make sure that everything is ready to go before you start working with your PC. So those are some of the basics that we have right now as far as giving you that high level view of what's inside a system. Again, don't worry, we're going to give you a lot more information as we move on in this video series. I just want to make sure you have that high view and understand some of the basic terms associated with it.